One of the things that's emerging in cancer, and it's so important, is that obesity and the metabolic syndrome that goes with it is almost as big a driver of risk for cancer as smoking is. Nobody really understands why, but the epidemiology, the statistics of populations are really showing that to be the case. The reason that I was attracted to Rice was that I was invited here uh, several years ago to be part of a conference. I and mean, it's one of the few science policy programs in the country. And I found it very exciting and I, I really enjoyed the place. I enjoyed the interaction of different dis disciplines. And I was invited back a few times. I never thought that I would have a position here. But then uh, I decided I was gonna retire from NBC after 38 years of reporting on science and medicine there. And they said, well, would you consider being a non-resident fellow? And I said, yeah, I think you people are doing great stuff, and I would be glad to cooperate in any way I can. Having somebody like Bob Bazell, who's uh, had this extraordinary career in the media, uh, especially in areas of science, technology, policy, a particular focus on health, it, it is really a coup for us. Cancer is a disease of old age. The longer you live, the more likely you're going to, you are to get cancer. This is something that's not publicized a lot the way it is. We, we all hear about a tsunami of Alzheimer's that's coming because the population is aging. But in fact, we're having a tsunami of cancer as well. We're very interested in science policy and very involved in science policy. And he brings expertise from many years of working directly on science policy, but in particular communicating it through the media to the public. Almost every drug has a story like that, where it almost doesn't get made. And the reason is that from the time a molecule is developed in the laboratory, it's then tested in cells, and then it's then tested in mice or some other animal, and then you have to have human trials. And human trials cost hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes close to a billion dollars, to get enough evidence to find out. And you never know never ever know from the test tube work or the animal work whether it's going to work in humans. I think it's a great opportunity for the students to really meet somebody who has actually been in the public, he's had you know, a career. It's also somebody who's been really digging into the biology of these issues but a different perspective than what they've gotten already. There are certain numbers of people who are very interested in science and we've, we've seen newspapers fail, we see fewer people watching news programs either at the local level or at the network level. However, the internet does have a different potential, which doesn't get emphasized a lot, because we, we think about BuzzFeed and all these other instant inst internet news services, but in fact, the internet has a different potential. It's a great storage device. So people who are interested in something like a complex scientific or medical problem, there is this wealth of information. There are great scientists uh, who have given at academic institutions all over the world who have lectures that are posted on the internet. You can go and find, if you go to the right sites, and it's not hard to to separate the good ones from the bad ones. You can find out incredible details about almost any subject you want. So we're gonna change, I think. Journalism, scientific journalism, will start giving you the headlines, but if you really care, and some people do, they can then go back and they'll have, they don't have to go to a library, they'll have this rich resource of places they can go to find all this information, and I think that shift is going on now.